Good morning, Fellowship of Praise, and welcome to all of you that are joining us this morning. Today is a special Sunday. I know Matt knows this because I have watched him study all week long. Today is Palm Sunday. It's Palm Sunday. Hosanna to God in the highest. We're so glad you're here with us. And we have people visiting from all over. This will actually be a blessing. It really will end up being a blessing. Uh, a man from India was quoting my message to me last week. And then my, my cousin Stacy, Stacy and his Harley Davidson and his shirt off, that's the only way I see him. I would have never thought. I saw you slip in on church last week. And uh, so many of your family, invite your family right now. Just go out, get, get a hold of them by your phone or however. Get them to watch today. Today's going to be awesome. Do you know what Hosanna means? Um, on the spot, I think it means praise, Savior. It means yes. adoration yes. and praise, but it comes from, it, it originally meant, the Hebrews meant God save. And we need God to save right now, don't we? All across the world, we need God to save. We know a young lady who's a a health care provider, a nurse. She's helped so many people, but she has COVID-19 right now. And for all of you, if you're suffering with that, we've got someone on stage, Angie, right here. There are people that have been laid off during this, and we're just believing that God is faithful, and He's going to watch over us. Isaiah 43, 19, He said, Behold, I will do a new thing, and now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? It's possible to not know this. Shall you not know it, but I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. That means direction and provision. God's going to take care of us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and let's worship the Lord together. Father, we thank you this day. You are a mighty God. You are an awesome God. We lift you up. We lift you up over all the earth. Hosanna. Hosanna. God save, God deliver, God heal, God touch. Be with us today, Lord, as always. Do something mighty in Jesus' name. We give you all the praise. Amen. Let's worship.
are gathered, he is there also. So he is with you right now in your home, wherever you are right now. He is with you right now. Just press into his presence. Come on. Just a little longer. Press into his presence.
presence of God has entered the room where you are. You may be driving down the road, but His presence is there. In fact, the psalmist said, where can I run from your presence? Where can I flee from your spirit? If I, if I ascend into the heavens, he said, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning, if I dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there, your hand will lead me. You'll guide me. God's watching out for us. I'm so glad you joined us today for Palm Sunday. And I have a special message today. And it's called a prophetic passage. I'm going to read something in the Bible that you might not think is necessarily called a prophetic passage. But today you'll see why it is. But more than that, it's actually a passage, a prophetic journey that Jesus was on right before the crucifixion. It's a prophetic journey, a campaign that a lot of things take place. A lot of things happen during this time. So I want to share with you today about hope and about God's blessings. And we're going to start in Mark chapter 11. And Micaiah, if you would, would you throw those glasses to me right there? Now let's see if I can catch them because I can't. <laughs> Where are those glasses? We're going to talk about hope today. We're going to talk about a prophetic passage in Mark chapter 11. Beginning with verse 1, it said, When they came nigh to Jerusalem, unto Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sendeth forth two of his disciples, and saith unto them, Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as you be entered into it, you shall find a colt tied where never a man sat. Nobody's ever ridden it. Loose him and bring him. And if any man say unto you, Why do you do this? Say that the Lord hath need of him. Straightway, immediately, he will send him hither. And they went their way and found the colt tied by the door without in a place where two ways meet. And they loosed him. And certain of them that stood there said unto them, What do you do loosing this colt? So just like he said, see, somebody might ask you, What are you doing? Verse 6, And they said unto them, Even as Jesus had commanded, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and cast their garments on him, and he sat upon him. And many spread their garments in the way, and others cut down branches off the trees and strawed them in the way. And they that went before and they that followed cried, saying, Hosanna. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the king of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now this is a story of contrast. Not necessarily contradiction, but contrast because we see disingenuous worship. We see people who are praising because they think he's going to be the king that conquers, that pushes out uh, Rome. That's what they want. That's what they're looking for. But he's not going to be the king that they want, but he's going to be the king that they need. And so they begin to worship him. The same people that are saying, hail him, king, one week later will be saying, nail him. Nail him to a cross. Nail him. He's no king. The same people. And so this morning I want to share with you throughout this story a contrast that shows us both sides but also shows a blessing that is taking place at the same time. For a few moments I just want to talk to you about hope. You know, the Scripture lets us know there is hope. The Bible says, as long as a man is in the land of the living, there's hope for him. We have hope in Christ. The Bible said if we live this life, if, if our trust is in this life alone, we are as men most miserable. If that's our hope, if it consists of just this life, we're miserable. Scripture said that hope maketh not ashamed. In other words, hope won't disappoint. 
In Job 14, it said there's hope in a tree that even if it's cut down and dies and withers through the scent of water, that represents the Holy Spirit, it will bud again. It will come back. And so there's hope for you. And I just brought a little illustration. I brought a friend from home. My daughter Madison has a hamster, and, you know, I smuggled this guy in here. Can you see him? Which I... He's usually so wild, I usually just take him and, and smash him against a hard surface so that he's more docile to play with. This is not a hamster, but she actually hid her hamster today. She took it to an undisclosed location. I think she took it to my other daughter's house, but uh, she hid her hamster because I think she knew I was going to have it tonight. But last week it was cats, this week it's rats. This was actually something that happened Johns Hopkins University. They did a study, and it was a strange study, bizarre study, but it caught my attention. And they were taking mice, and they were putting them in water. And they were seeing how long it took for the mouse to drown. And on average, it took 10 minutes. After 10 minutes, they could fish him out, and he was dead. As they fished him out of that water, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. But they found out something. I think this is so interesting. They found out that if they saved him within that 10-minute frame, if they would save him two or three times just within that 10-minute frame, that he wouldn't just swim for 10 minutes. He would swim for 60 hours. 60 hours. Now that's amazing. Because the brain in that thing would be so small, but just introducing that much hope that you could be saved, that you could be delivered. It could go a hundred times farther, a hundred times longer, just with the little introduction of hope. And today I want to introduce hope to you. His name is Jesus. If you don't know him, his name is Jesus. He is the Christ. He is the King, and he will deliver and the scripture tells us that Jesus came to Bethpage and he's on his way into Jerusalem. And before he gets there, he sends out two of his men and he sends them out and he says, go over to this town, Bethpage. And he said, you will find this donkey. You'll find a donkey. Now, the donkey was not a a. a a very likable animal or creature. In fact, Josephus, the writer of the Gentiles, uh, who, who was the most famous writer of the Gentile historian, he said he called it a beast of burden. He wouldn't even call it what the Bible called it, an ass. He wouldn't even call he's, He always called it a beast of burden. And so it was so common that was so unnecessary or, or for, for a king to enter a city on a donkey. But the prophecy part of that goes back to Zechariah 9 and 9, where in nine chap chapter 9, verse 9, the Bible said, 500 years prior to this, your king shall come meek and lowly, riding upon an ass. And this is Jesus that's going to come into the town with humility. So they were used to pomp and circumstance. They were used to a big show. If there's one thing that I believe that God is doing to the church right now is he's getting rid of the big show. They were used to the big show. They, they were, were used to all, all of the, the beauty and the grandeur and something that looked magnificent. For, for instance, Pompey came in after going out on a crusade through, through Africa and India. He came back with his chariot behind four elephants. Now, that's a triumph. That's the triumphal parade, the, the, the march. They, they come through town, and, and Caesar, Julius Caesar, would come in on with four white stallions before him, and his, pace, his face painted red, and he came in. And, and different ones all throughout history, Alexander the Great, so many different ones, but here comes Jesus, meek and lowly, and riding upon a donkey, an ass. 
And the scripture said that Jesus told two of his disciples, he said, go out and find this one. And he, it, there's actually two things that happen right here. One of those is a word of knowledge and one is a word of wisdom. Because he actually says where it's at. He tells them where it is. And then he tells them about its condition. So he gives a word of knowledge. He says it's, it's there in this town. It's tied up at this corner. And then he gives a word of, of knowledge. And then he gives a word of wisdom. And he says, and it has never been written. He knows all of this. He knows all, there's, a, there's a reason, okay? I want you to hear this. He knows all of this. He knows this. He knows where you are. And he knows your condition. He knows where you are and he knows your condition. He knows its condition. He knows that it, it is bound and it's never been loosed. It, it, it's bound. Even there, though no one has ever wrote it, it's untamed. He says, I know where it is and I know it's bound. And so he sends them and he says this caveat, this disclaimer. He said, if anyone asks, if anyone asks where, where, you know, who wants this, you tell them the Lord hath need of it. Now, this is the word kyrios. It's not the word Adonai. This is the word kyrios, the Lord. He says the Lord, the, the word actually means the master or the owner. So just picture with me, you're in your house and you hear your garage door lift up. You hear your car crank up. And you go outside and you see somebody driving away in your car and they roll down your window and, and you say, what are you doing? Who's doing this? And you say, the owner, the owner. And you say, okay, I'm fine with that. Unless it's a bank repossessing the car, that doesn't make sense. But what Jesus is saying is, I'm the owner of everything. It belongs to me. And when we find out that it all belongs to him, He's going to take care of us because it all belongs to him. And so he sends them out and they bring this donkey. And, and just like they had said that, that someone came and just tried to stop them, they, the same thing happened. They said that the master, the owner, hath need of him. And so he comes. And in verse Seven, the Bible said they brought the colt to Jesus and they cast their garments on him and he sat upon him. And many spread their garments in the way and others cut down branches. And they cried, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Jesus comes through town in humility. Humility attracts God. Pride repels God. Humility draws God close. Whatever you're going through right now, if you can come before God with humility, God is attracted to humility. And Jesus on this white ass, this white colt, is coming through town. Now, I want to just take you on a little prophetic loop this morning and just show you something because in Judges chapter 10, there were 30 judges. These were the judges, just like in our court systems. These judges only rode white asses. That's what they rode. That was the vehicle of choice. They weren't supposed to come into a town and look pompous or proud. They were supposed to look humble and that they would be righteous judges that gave righteous judgment. Here we see Jesus on a white ass. So I just want to share this with you. Here we see Jesus as a judge. Now, it might seem that everything is happening right here as he's coming through town and as the parade is going on and as they're, as they're throwing their garments and they're, they're, they're strowing uh, palm branches before him. But the real scene is being set a little bit farther. The real scene is being set 
in the temple because the day is not over. And the day, actually, this is just the beginning of the day because Jesus is headed to the temple. 1 Peter 4, 17 says, The time has come. The judgment must begin in the house of the Lord. It begins here. God can't judge the world until he judges his church. That means the church has to be broken. The church has to be humble. The church has to be ready to receive. The church has to be on their knees. I know many of you today and throughout this week, like myself, have fasted and prayed. It's, it's difficult. When you begin to fast and pray, you, you not only hunger food, it, your, your, your train of thought sometimes, just you just can't get it all together. But you know what you're doing is you're breaking yourself down and you're making an empty space. Making, creating an empty space. You're pushing out the food or whatever it is you're fasting and, and you're allowing God to come in and God to do something mighty. Some of you have been fasting for your, your spouses or fasting for your children. Some of you are fasting for your parents. But I want to tell you that this is a time like we've never seen before. And this is a time for every one of us for self-examination. This is the time for every one of us to seek God, the Bible said, while he may be found. You know, the scripture tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, it says that there will come a day where people are saying peace and safety and then sudden destruction will take place. Peace and safety. You know, at the beginning of this year, everything was so good. I mean, really our economy was so good. Everything, we, we haven't seen it so good. Besides all of the politics and, and all of that, uh, everything else just seemed to be so good. But then comes a virus and changes everything. And we don't know when this is going to end. We don't know when this is going to be over. Some of you are, are, are have lost your job. Some of you are right at the place of, it could happen tomorrow. It could happen at the end of this month and to the next month. But we know that God is faithful. David said it like this. He said, I was young, but now I'm old, and I have never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed out begging for bread. I believe that God's going to keep us. God's going to help us through this whole thing. You know, this week in John 21, and I'm just kind of meddling around here, but this is a prophetic service. I want you to hear this. Uh, John 21 tells us about uh, after the resurrection of Jesus that he comes back and he's with the disciples and th they're out in a boat and he's on shore. He tells them this is once again, this is this another time. This happens and they pull up these fish. And Scripture said that when they pulled them all the way to the shore, they counted them. If I'm not mistaken, I, I think there was 153 of them. And in John, it said large fish. 153 large fish. You know what that means? It means keepers. I'm keeping that one. That's, that's a big fish. That, that's a large fish. Number 153. This week, as I was listening to the news, I heard, and that was early in the week. So who knows? Maybe you know. I don't. But there was 151 nations that had coronavirus. I immediately thought about those 153 fish because they represent people. They represent people groups. They rep represent tribes. They represent nations. That's what they represent. And God said to the disciples, you'll be fishers of fish. No, he said, you'll be fishers of men, fishers of men. But they're keepers. God, God hasn't given up on, on one nation. God hasn't given up on one country. God hasn't given up on us. We can't give up on him. You've got to trust Jesus because Jesus has a plan. 
Jesus has a plan. We'll get right back to our story. He's coming through the parade. They're lavishing him. They're just praising him. They're praising. The Bible says a man is judged by the praise he receives. You know, I've been around long enough to know that there are people that will praise you. There are pre people that will be loyal to you as long as you have something they need. But when their needs change, their loyalties change. I've been around long enough to know that there are people that are loving you one minute, hating you the next. But Jesus is just going to, he's just riding on by. He's just passing on by because the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And so he heads to the house of God. This is the second time. It happens at the first time at the beginning of his ministry and the second time at the end of his ministry on earth. And he goes into the temple. And he begins to weave cords together. And he begins to make a whip. And he sees things that are wrong. And he see th sees things that need to change. He, he, sees, he sees the church begging for money or, or, or manipulating or extorting money. He sees all of this going on. And the Bible said that he begins to beat people out of church. Now, this is the craziest church growth seminar of all times. He drives people out of church. The Bible said that he kicked over the seats of the money changers. He, he, in other words, they could not sit down. They could not relax. They could not, it was not business as usual. And then he pushed over the tables of the money changers. The things they counted on. Some of you, during this time, during this process, all of the things that you have counted on have changed. I told my son two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago, I said, tomorrow you will live in a different world. And I was, true, I was right, because this is a different world. None of us have ever been here. We're navigating uncharted territory. So he pushes over the tables. He pushes over the chairs. He pushes over the things they once counted on. But this is what else he does. The Bible said that he releases the doves. Those were the ones that they were going to sell. They were the caged bird. In a lot of our churches, you see, a dove represents the Holy Spirit. In a lot of our churches, we have caged the Holy Spirit, because we're so afraid of what people will think. We're so afraid. You know, there's crazy people in every walk of life. There's, there's, there's crazy people in, in Senate right now. There's, there's, there's crazy people. There, there, there might be somebody that's the Speaker of the House, but not Speaker of my house. There's, there's crazy people in every walk of life, but people want to pick on something that happens in church. I want to tell you this. In these last days, I stand before God, and I'm not afraid to say this. God wants to release his dove. He wants to release his Holy Spirit. He wants to touch your families. He wants to break the bondage and the stronghold of drugs. He wants to heal bodies. He wants to bring us back to the place that we should be ready for his return. And that's what he will do to the church. And it won't be all of this church against church or church against the world stuff. It will be all of us Lifting our eyes and looking up and believing that Jesus is coming back. I want to pray with you this morning. This has been a difficult sermon. Not every sermon I preach is difficult. But for some reason today, it's been difficult. And I know I could go back and I could, I could maybe try to figure out how to do a better sermon. But sometimes God makes us low 
so that he can get all the glory. Many husbands out there concerned about your family. You pride yourself as being the breadwinner, but here you are in a place you've never been. And fear has just covered your home like a dark blanket. Many wives that so cherish that security and just afraid, not, not only for yourself, but for your children. If ever we needed the Holy Spirit to move in our land, it is now. It is now. If ever we needed to kick over the tables that we once counted on ourselves, say, God, we're just going to trust you. We're going to trust you with our lives. We're going to trust you with our finances. We're going to give. This will be all I say about giving this morning, but we're going to give the way we're supposed to give. We're going to trust you through it all because you're a faithful God. I want to pray with you right now because I saw something early and I just went past it. But in my mind, I just keep wanting to go back to that little donkey that was tied up. Nobody had ever rode it before. So you would think to yourself, you think if, if it's never been ridden, then it's untamed. It's wild. When we think of something being wild, we feel like there's no restrictions. We're unrestrained. It's wild. We say wild and free. But guess what? It was wild and bound. He said, you'll find it tied up. And Jesus knew exactly where it was tied up. And he knows exactly where you've been tied up. He knows what has tied you up. And what has held you captive. And then he says these powerful words. The Lord hath need of it. I need it. That's how much he cares about you. That's how much he loves you. And he says, I need you. I need you. He loves us. He loves us. I want to pray with you this morning. Right there where you are. We can pray. You can open your heart. You can humble yourself. You can receive Jesus Christ right there. In fact, you might want to get on your phone and say, I received this morning the Lord. So, Father, we come before you right now. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We lift you up. We exalt you right now. We praise you. You are great and you are greatly to be praised. We worship you. We pray, Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, no longer do we want you in a cage. We want you to bless us. We want you to help us. We want you to comfort us. It is not by might nor by power. It's by your Spirit. We need you. We desire you. Like cold waters to a thirsty soul. So is good news from a far country. God, you sent this word today to heal us and to deliver us from all destruction. So we call upon you. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We call upon you, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, save us. Jesus, redeem us. Jesus, heal us. Jesus, forgive us. Jesus, help us to forgive others. 
call upon you. You're faithful. You are good. And we love you. And we turn. Come on, we turn. Tell him this morning, I turn. I turn towards you, oh Lord. You're my God. You're my God. God bless you. We thank you to our church members. Thank you for your faithfulness, your generosity, your giving. Don't forget fopchurch.net or look on our FOP app. and You can give that way, but we thank you because you're the reason we can do what we do. God's going to help all of us through this time of difficulty, and he's going to bless us. Our steps are ordained. They're ordained. So may the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. Be gracious unto you. Lift his countenance upon you. Give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen.